Hello again. Um, I am privileged now to be able to introduce to you our keynote speaker today. And what you're going to see is a conversation between me and Brian Bellendorf. Brian Bellendorf is an amazing guy. He co-founded the Apache Software Foundation. He also was the first person to say we really should be teaching companies these methods. And so in a way, he's also the co-founder of Intersource Commons because he's the one who came up with Intersource as an idea. And I uh, wanted to let you know that this video uh, was filmed outside earlier this month because of COVID. We were in a, in a big conference and indoor spaces weren't feeling so safe. So we did it outside. Um, there are therefore some strangenesses around um, sound, but I think we've got them mostly solved. So you should be able to enjoy it. And I hope to see you in the chat. Ask any questions, I'll be there. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so nice to finally get to see you it's without awesome. a mask on. Yeah, it's always great to see you. And closer than 10 feet away from each other. It's awesome. <laughs> a little bit closer than 10 feet, yeah. Yeah, we really are. It's, yeah, it's great. So thanks so much for agreeing to do this. Um, I think you know that I talked to Tim uh, last year mm. about the beginnings of Intersource. Mm -hmm. And um, so you're the other half of that party. So that's why we asked you to talk to us today. Okay. So you're going to have to think back 20 years. <sighs> I know, I know, it's a long time ago. Yep. So when I met you, um, I was trying to help Sun open source Java and you were very interested in that project. Mm -hmm. So much so that even before I talked to you, you had already started to set up a home for Java eventually at Apache, mm -hmm. right? And so do you wanna maybe briefly tell the beginnings of the Apache story and how you sure. guys found the way of working? Sure. So uh, Apache got its start kind of early 1995. Um, uh -huh. Many of us who had been using the free NCSA web server, which came from the same group that did Firefox, uh, sorry, not Firefox at the time, <laughs> NCSA Mosaic, um, uh, and uh, this, uh, this, you know, really low, low quality, but, but functional kind of HTTPD. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, it was built by a bunch of college students uh, that eventually then left to go form Netscape, right, right. Uh, along with Mark Andreessen. Right. And many of us were using it. I was at Wired Magazine at the time. I was also building a personal website around the rave scene in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I'd also started a um, uh, one of the first web design companies called Organic. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Apache got its start when a bunch of us who were on that NCSA list realized, uh, hey, all these uh, developers or these students are going and getting real Silicon Valley jobs at uh, 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 Netscape, that's great, but we really would rather you know, keep using this this kind of you know poor quality, but we could improve it server that we were getting for free. In fact, the premise was you get it for free. The, the quid pro quo is if you find a bug, you fix it and you contribute the fix back upstream, right? right? It's not even just report it and consider your job done. It's like, no, you have the source code, you can fix it. So um, Apache got its start when that group of us said, let's continue this work forward. Let's give it a different name because it was a fork and we didn't want to confuse people. So it suggested a name uh, of Apache and, and picked that up. Uh, we were on our own mailing list and then our own CVS tree. Uh, and it was about uh, uh, you know a few months later when we realized everybody was using a, the the web server, <laughs> right. uh, and everybody from the Vatican to the NSA, you know, it was pretty good and range. And the Dalai Lama. And the Dalai Lama at one point. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, and and yeah, and 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 lots before for like production purposes too, right? It yeah. was like not just for the free sites because there was no money, but but like you know again like the Vatican, uh, they have some money, I think. Um, uh, they could have paid money to to run something, but they chose to run Apache, and so. Um, it was around 90, it was a few years then after, uh, as we were getting going, when we realized, well, we don't want to get, uh, uh, run the risk of going to jail for the crime of giving away software that might inadvertently uh, uh, violate somebody's patent or violate somebody's uh, copyrights or whatever. So um, uh, we started to think about putting a foundation around this. and. Companies like IBM started expressing some interest in getting involved. In, um, and so then it made sense to incorporate as an organization. So you guys developed a way of working together. And then Roy got it together to realize that it was a unique thing and studied it in order to get its masters. And that was the Apache way, mm. right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, we didn't even really formalize it so much as um, go, well, what are the traits? I mean, the traits that seemed to be traits for any successful internet community at the time, mm -hmm. which were, if you're going to engage online, be 
um, actually, this is the way that was codified, but more in the IETF, be uh, liberal in what you accept and conservative in what you spend, uh, mm -hmm. not in a political context, of course, mm -hmm. but in the context of if somebody says something that you disagree with, kind of look, look upon it with kind eyes, right? right? When you make claims about things, be humble about it, right? right. Um, uh, and, and try to always recognize that, you know, even if you think you have all the answers, you're probably at best 80% of the way there, and there's always some useful bit that the other 20% can fill in. Um, and, 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 you know, no, and, and so a, a passionate belief in like the power of people through conversation. I mean, it sounds very archaic at this point. It feels like the internet is so past that point and not, not this idyllic, you know, uh, not in idealistic best, Not in its best place. times. It, it still at, happens. At its best time, it still happens yeah. here and there. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure of it. Uh, it's just not the stereotype we have now of, of the internet, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but it, the Apache way did seem to be a premise that, well, if it, if the conversation didn't happen online, it didn't matter, right? Right, um, which uh, turns it, out to be secret sauce, I think. It, it, it certainly, I mean, I see a lot of communities go sideways when the real decisions are made on a private mailing list right. or in a private, yes. and actually my any pattern is conference calls. And I know I'm archaic on that front and I know conference calls have their place, but like for me, engagement in the written word gives yeah. me both the ability to respond quickly if I need to, or to take the extra five minutes to make sure that nonsense that I'm spouting is is actually true or not right you know or, or the thing i think is true is actually true or yeah. if i say somebody ought to go look up x well i'll take the extra five minutes to go look up x rather than like you know yeah. like like they email gives me that that even chat doesn't give right yeah. so yeah. so that was part of it the transparency is a part of it the, the being humble is a part of it um also uh, the the premise that we should actively be working to remove our remove each of us as like a critical dependency you know right. um partly you call it the hit by the, the bus the bus factor or whatever right, the bus factor. um uh, or call it just wanting to avoid cults of personality uh, 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 or but that, that was almost a, that was a really big choice for you guys because most of the free software projects at the time were very much cults of personality you know you chose not to become a bdfl mm -hmm. Well, I, part, partly because I just lacked my own you know, confidence, my own ability to make technical decisions. Like mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm not a great programmer. I have to be honest. Like all my technical contributions in, into Apache, de minimis compared to to yeah. people I really liked and respected. Right? Yeah. No, um, your your and, genius is social hacking. Well, it well just trying to be an air traffic controller right. rather than you know, which even that sounds too top down. It, it's certainly not Pied Piper. It's certainly not like uh, a ring ringmaster or anything like that. It's mm -hmm. it's a little bit more kind of. Um, uh, 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 subtle nerd diplomat is kind of the term I like to yeah, use today, right? That's exactly um, right. Uh, and so I just try to do that and always respect kind of the technologists, even when they disagree with each other. That there's kernels of truth, even in, in folks who might be wrong, you know, um, mm -hmm. or have their own agendas or motivations, but just to always kind of listen. Um, but yeah, with Apache, it was about that. It was about also avoiding kind of the corporate angle to the BDFL thing, which is avoiding a company stepping up and like saying they own a project because then right. you end up conflating the interest of the community with the interests of shareholders right. uh, and um, that always felt to me like like a tension that i wouldn't trust myself to be able to resolve let alone you know somebody else um so, so we talked a bit about the apache way now at what point did you say to yourself this apache thing seems to be going pretty well we should be teaching this to companies so when did it occur to that? So uh, uh, so so part of it was reproducible around Apache, um, but then it occurred to me that you know the governance around Apache would scale up to a certain point in terms of numbers of projects. Just I think I think communities have upper bounds to to how many people they can assume, and I mm -hmm. didn't feel like any of us wanted Apache to be like what GitHub is today, you know, right. like a gigantic right. giveaway to the masses. Um, that didn't seem su sustainable at the time, and 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 kind of not what any of us wanted to do. Um, but it, in the more sustainable model to me did feel like, well, you know, there's the Python community, there's the Perl community. Why don't we fan out and help those communities form, uh, you benefit from the same kinds of infrastructure that um, Apache benefited from. So that's one angle at it. Um, oh, and by the way, some of these communities might be corporate sponsored. So that's where the connection to, well, if there's a company like Sun behind Java, yeah. you know, maybe going to Sun and saying for a fee, a company might help you set up this kind of infrastructure. Right. Made sense. Which um, Sun made a huge use of. Yeah, yeah. Right. So Sun was Collabnet's, uh, I'm not sure by revenue if it was number one or HP was number one, but between HP and Sun, 
Uh, that was about 70% of CloudNet's revenue for its first sure. five years um, for two very different purposes. HP was really about intersource right. rather than in public. And I want to give HP due credit in the history of intersourcing with yeah. kind of doing a lot of they the initial thinking about friends. that. Yeah. I, all of the case studies were HP at the beginning. I always yeah. quote the one about the, the print, uh, um, the, the device drivers for the printers and how they originally had one for every model of printer and you guys helped them squeeze it down to a reasonable number. Yeah, and, and again, I mean, all, all we were doing is providing the collaboration infrastructure at CollabNet. Uh, that is uh, not all you did. Well, and, and then, I mean, secondarily to help people use that well, yeah. the community tooling and, and, I mean, and the community Jason and I wrote, wrote a lot of curriculum about how to it's collaborate. True. No, it, it was rarefied, more rarefied knowledge than I expected, having kind of grown up on the internet, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, this recognition that there's a vast field of the computer science, or a vast group of the computer science field who had never used collaborative tooling before. You know, even though source code management tools like CVS have been around forever, SCCS or Visual Source Safe or, or, or things like that, they were always amongst really small teams of people who were typically working in the same office, you know, who could typically say, no one touched this, I'm going to edit there, you know, like, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and it's a much different world when you're talking about people you've never met before, uh, and a lot of asynchronous collaboration and a, and a, and a long tail of small collaborators in mm -hmm. addition to full timing. So, um, so yeah, it seemed like in the early 2000s, late 99, no one had really like put together um, uh, kind of a reproducible methodology around running collaborative uh, uh uh, projects like this, and then that emerged. And and CollabNet's role, uh, and for, for, for those watching at home, so CollabNet was a company that I started in 99, um, uh, along with Tim O'Reilly, uh, uh, and, and and then a whole bunch of other people, you know, came on board and helped. Uh, and, and um, at its, you know, we were the Kickstarters for the Subversion Project um, yes. to replace CVS, and, and I'm still very proud of what we built there and I feel like it played a big role in annoying Linus enough to get him to develop Git. Yeah, I think uh, you're right. Uh, uh, talked a, whole, a whole bunch of people tried to tell Linus to stop using BitKeeper and and, um, and, he, uh, and he hated that, that, they, that he should just switch to Subversion. He didn't like Subversion's model, which is fine, and that's what provoked him to write Git. Um, and in a way, CollabNet, uh, I mean, we had a bunch of different ideas and concepts, but this software collaboration infrastructure was really the big one, that one that ended up being most sustainable. But in a way, we were kind of two or three generations too early compared to yeah. what a later GitHub and GitLab and some others came along and built, and yeah. which is um, no, 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 uh, I, uh, you know, uh, the smartest people in the world kind of, I think, I think got involved with, with, with CloudNet, the, the smartest minds on this problem. We helped a whole lot of companies learn about this space uh, and figure out what to do. Um, so I'm really proud of what we built there. Yeah, um, I think it was a great company. Yeah. I yeah. do. I, you know, I was, as you know, almost went to work for it at one point. Yeah. I, I think that teaching people how to work this way is the best gift that we can give to engineering for giving us this life we've just had. Yeah. Right. That's why I started in Source Commons because I, I looked like I, I had about a decade left. <laughs> right. And what, what was the best play I could make for open source to sustainability? Nadia had just noticed there weren't enough maintainers and maintainer fatigue was a real problem. And I'm thinking we can't grow maintainers. We have to take people who are already working and yeah. teach them this because they're already better maintainers. Because they're doing it now, they're just using another method. I think that was the biggest challenge we had at CollabNet, was the realization that um, software development teams who were using us for internal collaboration purposes um, did not have that instinct about how to engage online, how to, how to deal with even other teams in the same company. To them, that felt like a hostile act rather than something that they wanted, right? Um, yeah, uh, and, right. And, well, and, and the so, force yeah. of change is always difficult, but it's much harder if the middle can push back about the dubious nature of the enterprise in the first place, which until open source prevailed, it seemed like it might yeah. not work. And know? I did think it also limited the consumption of open source by enterprises when their devs didn't know how to work with it, didn't have that yeah. principle of contributing upstream or uh, participating in external open source projects or that kind of thing. So um, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they was, need the whole package. And, and the tooling and the training at yeah. the same time and, yeah. and the guidance. Well, so. these days, of course, the tooling is provided by GitHub and GitLab, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. we try to give them the training. Or, or, well, when I say we, it's it's an interesting thing. So Intersource Commons is um, about a thousand, you know, the triangle that, that um, Roy found, you know, for every 10,000 users, there's a thousand contributors and a mm. hundred 
you know, lead contributors and one or two that actually are yeah. in, in charge of things. We have that as well. But we have a few very active members who really see this as the future. Either they they were developers in a company that and they couldn't stand the lack of reuse and they tried to implement it in their own company and got as far as they could with it and then they came to us for help to make it bigger mm. or um in some really famous cases companies that figured it out on their own like without our help but were super happy to find out that other people were doing it too yeah. and um and they had already proven to themselves that it helped them solve problems like the problems people are solving are amazing. Mm -hmm. Bosch couldn't figure out how to get innovation to happen mm -hmm. because their engineering shop was too well oiled. You know, nobody ever stepped out of line. So they created an institutional opportunity to step out of line, which they called Bosch Internal Open Source or BIOS, mm -hmm. which is great. You right. know, and they got all this funding because it was coming out of the research institution. So they had funding to research stuff anyway. So mm -hmm. why not research this? You know. So that, that's a fascinating story to me. But the one that really kills me is Microsoft, you know, of course, famously hired a bunch of Apache people to work on Azure. And um, they're really happy with the outcomes they got from that shift that Satya signaled that we're going to start caring about open source a little more. And now they've got they've got jobs posted for people to teach them how to do intersource across their whole engineering organization because they can see that collaboration might actually be a better choice sure <laughs> which is great well i think it's also a recognition that the art of software engineering is not a solitary uh you know pursuit is not the kind of thing where it's like like okay so like if you're a chef you know yeah you might go to you know take classes you might teach you might mentor a little bit here and there but generally speaking, you're known for a style of, if you develop a signature kind of style, you kind of own that in a more proprietary way as, a, as, a, as an art form, as a, as, a, as a career. But software engineering does not benefit if it's just like kept to one person. Like, like there's perhaps a few examples of iconoclastic uh, kind of software engineering types out there, right? Um, certainly people whose code I trust more than other people's, <laughs> um, uh, you know, whether it's a Linus Torvalds or it's a Dan Bernstein or, or other things like that. Um, uh, but uh, but generally speaking, software is improved. The more people look at it, interact with it, touch it, like, like engage in its creation, but also its stewardship, right? Uh, and it's it's um, unlike you know food or or novels or most other works where it's it you know it reaches some static point and then it's done. Software, I mean, you know, you know the joke like the last bug is fixed and the last user is dead, right? right? right. So um, <laughs> it has it's it's this life cycle. It's the and and it needs replenishing, you know, mm -hmm. and it needs uh, reinvention. It needs at least main, main, maintenance, right? And so you need for to avoid burnout to to avoid that bus factor. You need that pipeline. You need you need a sense of flow through that that most other creative either creative endeavors or professional endeavors don't seem to have the same thing. I don't yeah. know. It's, it seems novel, and I don't. I don't think that was taught in engineering school or in, uh, uh, you know, engineering management kinds of schools, you know, until the 2000s, you know, until yeah. open source came around. It was kind of something we had to be a bit subversive around. But uh, but thinking about now about how to do that in a secure context, too, is uh, kind of on my yeah, mind as well. Yeah, that's your new thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Are you, tell me why you're excited about this. Well, um, I think uh, there's a lot in how software is built, how we collaborate, how we push stuff through distribution channels and how we accept it at the end point where we take, we kind of make a whole series of assumptions about the, the ground, that the ground we stand on is, is, is stable, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that has to do with things like, I mean, I choose which software packages to use based partly on who's behind them, right? I think most software sure. developers do, right? I think that's one reason people trust Linux or use Linux is they trusted Linux. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it gets that maybe that's conflating with the cult of personality stuff a bit too much, but um, but we had this default assumption that people wouldn't try to hack personalities you know, or hack uh, hack accounts in order to push uh, fraudulent releases. Uh, we have this assumption that GitHub will never be hacked or compromised. Um, that's happening. We have uh, yeah. an assumption that uh, uh, you know the package, the package uh, sites like npm and pypy and others, you know that. We can just in our in our production systems and like when we push a code, you wouldn't believe how many like um, production push processes pull down code in real time from the upstream sources rather than being something that was like carefully stewarded from the development cycle. And mm. meaning when somebody you know if decides somebody puts to a mal malicious thing in the package, it comes down right, and and, and right. you didn't even see that because it wasn't in your test environment or right. something like that, right? Yeah. Um, uh, or or they pull their package out of a license dispute or something like that, and suddenly like production websites go down, right? It's it's a little absurd. So so I'm worried that there's a lot of default assumptions that were made in an era when 
um, we felt that you know uh, trust was easy to to acquire, easy to share, uh, and and frankly, we should be a little bit more paranoid because there's a lot more at stake. And spending the last five years in the the blockchain industry, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, that's a community that kind of grew up in kind of a zero trust environment that right. assumes that there were hostile actors everywhere, and you kind of had to engineer from the beginning to uh, avoid you know, compromises to the ledger, compromises to smart contracts. Uh, and and you do design things and operate things very differently in that context. And so um, that's what I'm excited to, to think. I'm not that I'm bringing, I'm not, I'm not an alien visiting from planet crypto or anything like yeah, that. Right. I'm, well, so I was just reflecting on our time of uh, back all those years ago of trying to get um, open source Java to happen in, in the right way and all the things we had to do to make that happen. And one of the things we had to do was fly everywhere. <laughs> Did you ever imagine we would spend as much time on planes as we have? That was well. That was like in two thousand. I think we visited like like yeah. We went around the world places. like four times yeah. in two thousand yeah. as, as part of CollabNet. That yeah. hasn't stopped though. And in a way, there's there's a lot of positive aspects to that. Like like there's a lot of information still conveyed face to face at Very conferences much so. yeah. uh, when you're collaborating with people. I mean, as much as like. I'm a, I'm a bigot when it comes to email and think like that's probably the best collaborative medium for exchanging mm -hmm. thoughtful ideas. I, I still can see there's a lot you can do around a whiteboard um, around yeah. uh, uh, and also a layer of trust that emerges between people. Right. I mean, I I trust pretty easily, perhaps to my detriment, but but for other people, it takes time and, and looking people in the eye. And so. Um, uh, I get that, and I get that's part of the nerd dipl diplomat job too. Is kind mm -hmm. of traveling. So that didn't stop when we stopped going around. I have spent have spent most of my career being on the road, uh, and um, really enjoyed that. Um, uh, at the same time, I've really enjoyed being entirely at home for the last eighteen months, aside from a few trips here and there. Yeah, my, that's really unusual for you. My daughter's six years old. It's that age where they still like their parents. So yeah. like I um, am, was really happy to be at home for that period yeah. and. Um, yeah, I'm not eager to get back to 60%. I don't think I do. I think I get to, to back to 25% at best. Were you surprised when Intersource Commons happened and was yeah. successful? No, I was really happy to see because uh, I, you know, I left CollabNet in 2007. Um, I had given my boss two years notice. I said, I, I'll stick with this for eight years. Um, and, and, it, and, you know, again, it did okay. We were proud of a lot of stuff. We kind of kicked off kind of a space. Um, but financially, it wasn't that interesting. But I didn't know what I wanted to do next, etc. Um, so, but I was I was worried that like this these ideas of helping com you know companies internally behave more like open source communities would kind of die with it, or get like I wasn't really happy with what, where Atlassian was taking it at that time. Mm -hmm. I felt um, I, I it kind of lost a little bit of the soul, even though I knew a lot of people loved uh, Jira. Mm -hmm. um, I think GitHub and GitLab are much closer to what we would have wanted it to be mm -hmm. anyway. So, yeah, so that's absolutely. that's really good to see. Um, it's so yeah. nice that Matt is there. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Well, and it's nice that they're a part of Microsoft. Too. Yeah. I mean, it sounds weird to say that. I don't know that 1999 me would have said Tim told anything us nice we had to be gracious and victory. <laughs> yep, yeah. Or when when did Microsoft sue us for, for the, the Sun lawsuit uh, oh, thing? Oh, yeah. Um, that was, that's another funny story. That, was, but that, that is a funny Maybe story. better lost to the history of time. That was 2000, but, 2001, something well, like that. Lawyers can be a funny funny uh, uh, yeah. uh, group of people, I just should say. And, and lots of money can be spent on lawsuits and time wasted. We'll just leave it at that. But super happy that um, uh, Intersource Commons launched that the mantle of like helping companies figure this out internally. And then also really happy with the rise of OSPOs. Yeah, uh, I think I think those are two important functions to help. Well, I want to thank you for coming up with the concept in the first place because it's given me something to do for the last decade, <laughs> and and something that I really believe in. I really think is what we need, um, or at least a component of sustainability of open source is broadening the scope of people who are allowed to do it. And uh -huh. you know, I know we all self-selected into it, but but we're also kind of a certain type of person and. And we need more of the other maintainer type of person, that, you know, right? right. Um, but uh, it's been really fun for me to sort of take the things I learned from you 20 years ago and make them work now. And um, I'm glad I was eventually right. <laughs> you absolutely are. Always I mean, I'm just right. such an idealist, you know, that, that I feel to be, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sometimes not as pragmatic as I'd like to be, but I, um, I, it's, it, Conditions change, and it is good to see that um, some of the stuff I had an intuition around um, actually does continue to bear fruit and create real value for people. So thank you for carrying the torch 
on that when I wasn't able to. Uh, and um, and be a you part had of other torches. You were, you were, I moved you're on to the on next. The forward torch. I, 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 it's the next window. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>